Do you like puzzles? Do you like mysteries, things that can be hard to figure out, hard to solve? And do you like controversies? Well, <laughs> some shaking their head no on that one. Today, um, we tackle one of the most, the most controversial line in the Apostles' Creed. It's so controversial that many have just removed it altogether from the Apostles' Creed and just read the Apostles' Creed without it at all. We're going to take it on today and, and see what, what it means. We began, and you might want to pull it, reach into your bulletin and pull out these purple sheets that have the Apostles' Creed on there. Uh, two two uh, messages ago, be three weeks ago, we talked about the first part, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And we said that it teaches us three things, that he's the Father, we can relate to him on a, in a personal relationship, that he is almighty, there's nothing he cannot do, and he's the creator of heaven and earth. He spoke everything into being and created everything out of nothing. And then two weeks ago, we talked about the first line in the longest section about Jesus Christ. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. And once again, there are three things in that line. He is Jesus Christ, which is the title, the Messiah. It's the anointed one. It's what they do to a king. And it tells us that Jesus is the king and he is our king. And he says he's the only son. That means he is co-eternal with the father and that he is uh, he's not just one of many sons of God. He is the only son of God. And then he is our Lord. He is our master. Then we surrender our will to him. So today we take on the next uh, four lines, the uh, next five lines actually, that uh, teach us some uh, really important teachings about Jesus, but also gives us this very controversial line. And this is what we're going to study today. These lines that says, Who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. There it is. That's the big one. And we're going to talk about that one today, too. But first, look at the first two lines that we're talking about. He was conceived of, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Those two lines are taken straight from the teaching of Luke chapter 1. We're going to put up a few verses here from Luke chapter 1 and show you from the Christmas story that we're all familiar with exactly where the Bible says that he was conceived of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. So we're going to read from Luke 1, starting in verse 26. In the sixth month, sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. You are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. That is also translated, nothing will be impossible for God. And verse 38, she, Mary answers, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. The, it's repeated several times that Mary is a virgin, and when the angel says to her that she will conceive, even Mary knew that this was impossible. Uh, they may not have had a, as advanced science as we have, but she knew it was impossible for a virgin to conceive, and so she asked the question, how will this be, since I'm a, still a virgin? And the answer came to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so that the Holy One will be born, will be called the Son of God. 
this tells us a couple of things about Jesus. When it tells us that he is conceived of the Holy Spirit, it is telling us that he is fully God. His Father is God. It also tells us that he is sinless because original sin is, was passed on through the fathers from generation to generation. If he had an earthly father, he would have been born with original sin, but he did not have an earthly father. His father was the Holy Spirit, and so he was born without sin. But because he was, uh, that his father was the Holy Spirit, he's born as one who is fully God. But it also tells us that he is fully man because he was born of the Virgin Mary. The early prophecies of Jesus in the, in the Old Testament um, tell us something that is very strange. It says that the Messiah will be born of a woman. And when you think about it for a minute, you have to say to yourself, isn't everybody born of a woman? Wait a minute, I was born of a woman, and so were you. I don't even have to know you well enough to say that about you. I'm sure of it. Everybody ever born was born of a woman. So why would the Old Testament say that the Messiah would be born of a woman? That's, that's assumed, right? Well, he tells us that because the Bible wants you to know that the Messiah to come was going to be a human being, fully man. Most of the false teachings about Jesus over the generation come because of a misunderstanding of what is called the dual nature of Christ. It's very hard for us to grasp how he can be fully God and fully man at the exact same time. And yet that's what the scripture teaches. And that's what the Apostles' Creed is trying to nail down because there was a group of people in the days when this was written in the first couple of centuries called the Gnostics. And the Gnostics spread a lot of false teachings about Jesus because they were convinced that everything on earth was, was tainted and sinful. And so God couldn't really have any physical components because otherwise he would be tainted and God cannot be sinful. So they believed that Jesus didn't have a physical body. He was more of an apparition, that he looked like a person, but he was, and we know he was fully God, but he wasn't really a human being. He wasn't fully human because that would be impossible. So that's what they were teaching. So one of the things that the, the Apostles' Creed made very sure of when they wrote this was to make it real clear that Jesus Christ was, was fully human. And as if to say, after telling you he was born of a, of a woman, born of the Virgin Mary, he gives you two more lines that emphasize his humanity when it says, he suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, died, and was buried. See, the Gnostics rejected that God could suffer and certainly rejected the fact that God could die. That's impossible. How could God die? How could God suffer? And yet, Christ, in his humanity, he suffered under Pontius Pilate. That's really significant to us, by the way. When we relate to Jesus Christ as our high priest, as our Lord, we need to know that he suffered the way you suffer. He, he experienced pain. He experienced thirst. He was tired. He was hungry. And he, he was even tempted in every way that we're tempted. So he understands us when we pray to him and we reach out and we cry out and express the agony that we're experiencing, he can understand that because he came to this earth in the flesh and he experienced suffering in this earth. John, when he wrote the first chapter of the Gospel of John, he made sure people understood that Jesus was fully God when he said, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God in the beginning, which means the Word, who is Jesus, was co-eternal with the Father. And then he said, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he couldn't say it any more plainly that Jesus Christ was indeed fully God and is fully God because the Word was God. And then later in the chapter he says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So he was fully God and he's also fully man. And John made sure of that when he, when he wrote that. The reason that that's so important is that as knowing that he suffered as a man, he understands us, but knowing that he was fully God, we also know that nothing is impossible. So you go to God and you pray. You pray when somebody has 
cancer that's inoperable, deadly cancer, and you pray that God can heal, and you know that God has the power to do that because nothing's impossible for him. If he spoke the world into being out of nothing, certainly any, there's no prayer that you could pray that's too big for God to do, that's impossible for him to do. So it's important that we know that he's man, that we, he relates to us, but we know that he's God and that nothing's impossible for him. He is at the same time infinitely powerful and intimately personal. When I was graduating from seminary, the, I had to take a comprehensive oral exam. It's just an absolute nightmare. Uh, it, what, that, what a comprehensive exam means that anything that we studied during three years of seminary was on the table and could be asked. Uh, so anything that, that we'd studied was, was a possibility. And being an oral exam meant that I sat in a room with all of my professors from seminary. Uh, they were all there in the room, and any of them could ask me any question that they wanted of anything they had taught over the past three years, and I was supposed to give them an answer. It was an absolute nightmare. And I, I felt like I was bluffing my way through pretty well until I got to this one question. One of my professors said to me, he said, were the Old Testament saints saved? That was his question. Were the Old Testament saints saved? I thought, well, there's an interesting one. I couldn't remember him teaching that to me during the three years, but uh, I was now to give an answer. And so I... I mumbled around and, and uh, stumbled and stuttered over this answer about how they, the only way a person could be saved is through Jesus Christ. After all, Christ said, no man comes to the Father but by me. And since Christ wasn't there when David and Moses and Abraham were around, that they must have been saved. They, you know, we know that Abraham was justified by faith, but he must have been, it must have been faith in the future Messiah, like the future faith in Christ. And so they were saved by faith in Christ, and, and I, I gave all of this. And after I gave this answer, there was silence in the room, never good. And then the professor, the same professor, looked at me, and in the exact same tone of voice, he said, were the Old Testament saints saved? The exact same question. And I just burst out laughing, because I, I thought I had just answered the question. And I said, well, obviously, I, I didn't answer it correctly the first time, and I have nothing right now to add to that, uh, so I guess I'm going to miss that question. This week, when I was studying when, uh, for this most controversial line in, in all of the Apostles' Creed, he descended to hell, I believe, I believe that I found the answer that I should have given all those years ago in that exam, and I'm going to look up that professor after church and call him up and say, let me try again to answer your question. Let's talk about this statement, he descended to hell. When we read that the very first time, many of you were shocked because this is a church that didn't, most of you did not grow up in a tradition where you memorized the Apostles' Creed and read it, so some of you were reading it for the first time. And everything you were reading was making sense to you. You believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. All of that makes sense. And then when you read this line, he, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, he he died, was buried, and uh, like was crucified, died, and buried, and then descended to hell. There was almost an audible gasp in the room the first time. People went, what? He descended to hell. What? And I have had people in the last few weeks come up to me and say, what does that mean? Where is that in the Bible? Because I told you right up front that the Bible, that the, uh, the Apostles' Creed is is a summary of the teaching of the apostles, but it is biblical, and everything that is in there is in the Bible. So people have said, where is that in the Bible? Well, you're about to find out. Um, this phrase, though, I want to tell you how controversial it is. Many have taken it out of the creed altogether, and you may have seen the Apostles' Creed written without the phrase, he descended to hell, because many just remove it because they don't want to deal with it. It seems odd for people to think about Jesus Christ descending into hell. You have a sinless Savior, Jesus Christ, descending into this place that we associate with Satan and with sin, and it just doesn't, seem, it doesn't make sense to us. 
why is it that we assume that Jesus would never go there? One of the assumptions we make is that the people who are in hell, they are there because they deserve to be there. In fact, somebody said to me, Does, is this implying that people get a second chance, that after they go to hell that they get a second chance? That seems contradictory to other passages of Scripture. I want to make a clarification first about our understanding of hell. A lot of, I hear all the time people talking about how can a loving God send people to hell? The idea of God sending people to hell raises a lot of controversy. I don't believe that God sends people to hell. I do believe people go to hell, but I believe they go to hell by their own choice. I believe that they they go to hell by their rejection of Jesus Christ, by the the fact that they they choose not not to follow God. They choose to reject God, and they spend the rest of their lives separated from God by their own choice. Uh, It seems that nobody would choose to go to hell, but you know many people on this earth who reject Christianity. They reject the the salvation through Jesus Christ, and they live their whole lives separated from God, and after they die and leave this earth, they spend all of eternity separated from God. In 2 Peter 3.9, we read that that God does not desire that any would perish, um, but people reject his, he's made it, he's given us the answer, he's given us salvation in Jesus Christ, but many people reject that. So this idea of descended into hell, what what is this place we're talking about? This is part of the controversy. The Old Testament word was Sheol. When it was translated into Greek, it was Hades. And we sometimes, some, in some, uh, Apostles' Creed, it says he had descended into the place of the dead. Sometimes they call this the abode of the dead. So the, old, the Bible has phrases like the, the bosom of Abraham and different, fra- different descriptions of this place where people are after they are dead. And it's very controversial as to what this is. Let's, uh, let's look first of all about where, where this teaching is in the scripture. And we're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 3 verses 18 to 21, because it's this idea of, pre, of Christ descending into hell is, is found in two places in the Bible, and there are two chapters back to back, 1 Peter 3 and 1 Peter 4. Let's look first at 1 Peter 3, 18 to 21. Peter wrote this, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Now pay attention, here's where it is. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through the waters. So there's the teaching right there. It says that... um, after being made alive. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit, after being made alive. And generally, the understanding is it was during those three days that he was in the, in the tomb, somewhere between Good Friday and Easter morning, after he be, was made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. We say, well, who were these imprisoned spirits? To those who were disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, to people in the Old Testament. Now this suddenly makes sense to me, that question, were Old Testament saints saved? How could they be saved? Because no man comes to the Father but by Jesus Christ. And so people like Abraham and David and others in the Old Testament had faith, but they didn't know Jesus. So it may be that what this is describing is Jesus Christ going to explain the, the salvation through Christ to men of faith who died before Jesus came along. That seems to be the, the picture. He made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. Let's look ahead at the next one in 1 Peter 4, and then we're going to talk about them together. In 1 Peter 4, verses 5 and 6. But they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. 
So here it says that the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead. So we put those two ideas together uh, from 1 Peter. And look at this phrase, he descended to hell. And that's what it appears that he, that he is preaching to these men who died before Christ came. Now some things in the ancient church that were very difficult for theologians to explain. They tried to express through artwork. And there were dozens of paintings of Jesus preaching in hell. We have one of those pictures in the, in, up here in front of you. I don't know if you're able to see all the detail of this, but there are many pictures like this where you see Jesus here on the right-hand side preaching to those who are imprisoned in hell. If you could look closer onto this picture and some of the others, many of these paintings depict Old Testament characters. In some of them, you see King David wearing a, a crown. Uh, you see, see Adam and Eve, sometimes naked in the group in there. And you'll see, you see Moses, and, and you see Abraham, and you see a lot of these Old Testament saints, so to speak. And Jesus is preaching to them, and often reaching out and grabbing them by the wrist, and bringing them out, setting them free from being imprisoned in hell. But almost every painting has this in common. When you look under the feet of Jesus... You see these broken doors that the, the gates of hell will not prevail, as it says, and the, the doors are broken apart, and under the doors is Satan trapped underneath the doors. And it's not just this painting, but you can Google this, by the way, and find dozens of, of ancient paintings of Jesus preaching in hell. And in almost every painting, you'll see the doors are broken under the feet of Jesus, and you see Satan trapped under the broken doors. And what these artists all seemed to understand, which I'm sure the theologians were teaching of the day, was that there was no place where Jesus cannot go. There, even, even death is not out of bounds for Jesus. That we, we read about this when in Romans chapter 8, when Paul says, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Neither death nor life can separate us from the love of God. It means that there's, there's no place where Jesus is not. There's no place that's untouched by the presence of Christ. Now, to us, I believe that one of the great lessons in all of this is that even in, our, in the darkest depths of life, Jesus will meet you there. Jesus can reach you even in the darkest depths. One other scripture that I think kind of ties these things together is in Hebrews chapter 2. We're going to put this up, Hebrews 2. And I want you to hear what the writer of Hebrews has to say. In verse 14, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. This is what I said earlier about the humanity of Christ. Because he suffered, he's able to help you when you suffer. Because he was tempted, he's able to help you when you're tempted. So he was made like you. And it says he, he would break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. This, these paintings, these teachings of Jesus descending into hell teaches us that he breaks the power of death, that sin cannot hold us. Sin is, I mean, death is, is the the greatest fear most people have. And this tells us in the Apostles' Creed very clearly that Jesus died. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. It tells us that Jesus died. The Roman guards made sure of that. You know, when they crucified someone, if that person didn't die, they would die in their place. So they made sure that he was dead. But then Jesus defeated death. We no longer have to fear that old enemy, death, because Jesus defeated death. When he was buried in that tomb, he was made alive. 
and he defeated death. You know, the reason ISIS terrorizes people is that people are afraid of, di- of death. They're afraid of suffering and they're afraid of death. But when you're not afraid of death any longer, when that enemy is taken away from you and you have no fear of death, ISIS has no control over you. Uh, terrorists cannot terrorize you when you're no longer afraid of death. Jesus died and then defeated death, walking right into hell as these pictures show, breaking down the doors, defeated Satan, and setting his people free from, from death. And he tells us he sets all of us free who all their lives were held slavery by the fear of death. Jesus defeated death. Even if you die, he said, you will live. So here's what it comes down to for us. Here is the the takeaway from all of this. He descended into hell. What in the world does it mean? What does it mean to us today? It means that the worst thing will not be the last thing. For many people, death is the worst thing that can happen. That's their biggest fear. But because Jesus has defeated death, the worst thing will not be the last thing. Let's pray together. Our Father God, these these concepts are, are, are new to us and they're strange to us and we don't pretend to fully understand them. But Lord, we do know this from your word, that Jesus Christ died in our place and he rose from the dead. Lord, we know that as his followers, we too will be, will be raised from the dead. We too know that we will live forever. Even though we die, we will live. And that old enemy of death has been defeated and has been defeated for us. And we praise you and thank you, Lord, that we no longer have to live in fear of death because Jesus has conquered death and been victorious. We praise you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you stand?